morning, all. Great to, great to be with you for another installment of Spiritual Economics. Trust you can see me and hear me. And we are going to get down to business rock and roll. It's a beautiful blessing to be with everybody again. So let's let's dive right in. Let's, uh, let's do this first. Take a deep breath and uh, get ourselves into a wonderful internal space of learning and exploration and just knowing that this morning is a wonderful unfoldment of life. Or this afternoon, if you're in a different part of the country or the world, not on Pacific time. All right, here we go. So today we're going to explore uh, three, th three the, the final three chapters of the book, Spiritual Economics. So discover the wonder of giving, a new look at tithing. And I want to make sure this, I want to make sure you know this isn't going to be a, a, an advertising, an advertisement for, uh, to get you to start tithing to the center or anything like that. It's, has, it's very closely tied to the idea of giving and how we give and how we receive participating in the law of circulation. And then to wrap it all up, we're gonna look at the final chapter of the book, which is called The New, New World Order, which is so fitting for what, uh, what we're experiencing right now and the revolution that's taking place uh, in our societies uh, and in our consciousness. So let's dive in, here we go. Let me get this. I'm having a bit of a freeze here with my slides. We'll get it going here in just a moment. There we go. All right. So from Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes, discover the wonder of giving. Freely ye have received, freely give. When the law of circulation is thwarted, stagnation results. It is only when we allow the divine current to flow through us and out that we really express life. The law of giving and receiving is definite. Emerson tells us to beware of holding too much good in our hands. Freely ye have received, freely give. So that's what we're talking about, giving. Uh, and we, I love the way Butterworth presents it. Well, we're just gonna keep on, on, on diving through here, but I love that quote from, uh, for this little bit of information from Ernest Holmes as well. Giving involves the many ways we make contact with life. It is an attitude with which you touch things, whatever it is, our loved ones, um, you know, our community, our money, um, all the blessings in our lives, the challenges in our lives. Giving involves the many ways we make contact with life. It is an attitude with which we touch things. So again, it comes back to that, what's that C word we talked about all, all week? Consciousness, belief, Attitude, feeling tone, our relationship with life. It is an attitude with which we touch things. Your life is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift to God. I love that. So we have received this life. And whether we want to uh, admit it or deny it or whatever, we chose to be here somehow on a metaphysical level and a level of consciousness to incarnate in the human condition to express something. So God, out of the only stuff that it could create, breathed life into every one of us. And out of that, we have life now as a human being. Giving is what you do with your life that becomes a gift to God, a gift to life. And since life encompasses all, what we do with our lives is a gift to each other. It's a gift to your spouse, to your partner. It's a gift to your children. It's a gift to your parents. It's a gift to the attendant at the gas station. It's a gift to the grocery store clerk. It's a gift to wherever we find ourselves touching life is our gift that we give. So what gift are you giving? Take inventory. Again, this whole thing is about mindfulness and being mindful of how we're touching life, how we're interacting with life. Are we awake to the blessing that we are, which goes back to some of the material that we've already covered? What are you aware of your, that, of your gifts and of your talents? What are you aware of that is your unique contribution to life? What are you aware uh, is your, uh, the beauty that you bring? Now, this isn't ego and it's not arrogance. It's simply an awareness of who we are, of what you can contribute. Uh, you know, I'm a sports guy. I love this. So I, I think a, a lot about sports and competition and athletes. And, the, and, and we can look at it from any standpoint, though. Bands, music, uh, artistry, 
whatever it is, a mechanic, individuals that are aware of their gift and how they touch life and how uh, you, you, you hone your craft, you work on your craft to be excellent at it. What do you want to be excellent at today so that you're glorifying the gift of life inside of you and then sharing it with life, with the world, in your home, in your community? What you do with your life is your gift to God. What are you giving today? Life is lived from the inside out. We know this. It all starts in consciousness. Things always are created twice. Things are created twice. First, in thought, and then in form. So again, I'll, re I'll remind us, I think on Wednesday, I said, watch your thoughts, because thoughts make words, and words create. Thoughts create, and then words create. Watch your thoughts, because thoughts make words. Watch your words, because words make actions. Watch your actions because actions make habits. Watch your habits because habits make character. Watch your character because character becomes your destiny. Thought, everything born twice, first in thought, then in form, you see. So the tendency of our thinking, the tendency of our uh, attitude and belief is how we touch life. So always life lived from the inside out. Again, it's why we want to continue tending to the garden of our thought, tending to the garden of our mind. What are you getting caught up in? Are you getting caught up in good? Are you getting caught up in fear? Are you getting caught up in blessing? Are you getting caught up in anxiety and worry? Life is lived from the inside out. The purpose of life is not acquisition, but unfoldment and personal development. Again, it's not just how many, how many, how many toys can I get? How much stuff can I get, you know, to become, we, we, we become great consumers of things. But at the end of the day, how much prosperity is involved with that? How much fulfillment is involved with that? How much blessing are we aware of? Or are we just collecting things? Russ, I see your face. Can you hear me? If you can hear me, will you put your hand up? Yep, we're good. All right. We just wanted to do a quick check in there to make sure everybody could hear me. Okay, so um, the purpose of life is not acquisition, but unfoldment and personal development. And of course, as we go through life, we will acquire things. It's fun to have toys. We've already explored this. It's fun to have the car that you want to have and go on the vacations that you want to have. But at the end of the day, what are we talking about? An experience. We're talking about an, in, a, 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 an inward uh, relationship with life. The purpose of life is not acquisition. We can acquire as many things as we want to. It's about unfoldment and developing ourselves, developing our consciousness, our awareness, developing our love, developing our capacity to give, which has us explore. Are you a giver or a taker? You know, there's a time to give and a time to receive for sure. But again, it's an attitude. It's an internal relationship uh, with, with, with your life. Um, are you seeking more to contribute wherever you find yourself or to take something away to get, there's a power whenever you walk into a room to think, give, to think, how can I contribute to this situation rather than the, the, the surface level shallow, what, what can I take from here? Um, bring inspiration rather than it's almost like theft, like trying to steal something, suck the spirit out of the room. Are you a what's in it for me? Or how can I give more? And in giving, in the law of circulation, again, the, the, the position of giving is the same as the position for receiving. So if I'm seeking to give something to you, I put my hands out like this, please have this. And look where my hands are. They're in a position of receiving as well. How can I give more? Again, it's an internal attitude. How can I give more? Not just going around vampiring, but going around giving, being very liberal in our giving. It says scripturally, it says the liberal soul shall be made fat. The liberal soul, that is the one, we're not talking politics and stuff like that here, gang. We're talking about being liberal with our spirit, being liberal with our uh, generosity, kindness. The liberal soul shall be made fat. How can I give more? With a little effort, we can give a lot more and just a little bit of effort. We can give a lot more in so many ways, a little more consideration, 
hugs, time, service, kind words, smiles, compliments, encouragement, love, money, forgiveness, attention, uh, understanding. Learn to give of the whole self is what we're talking about here in every way. We know how, how far a compliment can go. Uh, how far, isn't it going to be great when we can finally hug again? I can't wait to hug the people I love again, you know? This virtual stuff is great. It's a beautiful technology. Oh, my God. But, the, but human touch is a beautiful thing. Encouragement. Uh, um, forgiveness. All of these things only make our life sweeter. All they do is add to our cup of joy. Rather than, you know, there, there was a couple of weeks ago, just that everybody was talking about this idea of hoarding, you know, and, and everybody was getting all their toilet paper. And I still can't find any Clorox wipes anywhere, you know. Somebody's got them. I know there's enough in the world for everybody. They're somewhere but they're not on the grocery store shelves anymore. So are you hoarding your good or are you sharing it? Because there's plenty. We're talking about an infinite well of good here, folks, that we can give from. Give what you have. You have generosity. You have, you can forgive. You can share love. We're talking about being an incurably happy giver. I love this. Emerson speaks of the need, and this is, so this is where the consciousness of giving comes from. Emerson speaks of the need for each person to have their own firsthand and immediate experience of God. Why is that? Because when we have that intimate relationship with the spirit within, and we know it to be our source and supply, we're personally touched by it. It's not just some far off idea that somebody else uh, uh, shared with me. It's not just some minister's idea of it. Any good minister worth their salt will always encourage every individual to create their own relationship with the Holy Spirit, their own relationship with the divine flow of life, to establish yourself in a unitive flow, unitive relationship with divine flow. Then we know it ourselves. You know, it's like you're interested in dating somebody or, you know, getting to know somebody or something like that. And some other person that's a mutual acquaintance tells you how wonderful this person is. But you don't know that person. You don't know them until you spend time. You don't know them until you go out to dinner a few times and take a nice walk along the path and start to talk and get to know each other. That's how we get to know God, is we spend time communing with it in our meditation, in our prayer, in our dialogue, in our reading, in our classes. We, we, we take time to explore what really is the God of my heart, the God of my understanding, which is an important part of, of folks that are in recovery circles as well. What is it? The God, as you understand it, the God of your own understanding. And then from there, it's easy to share because we realize that what we're communing with is an infinite flow of divine goodness, is an infinite flow of of idea and inspiration and love and generosity, the spirit continues just to give to us. And so why wouldn't we want to give and circulate to receive the blessing of a personal communion with the spirit and then share it, establish yourself in a unitive relationship with divine flow. When you discover the wonder of giving, you become an incurable giver. I love that. And he goes on later to say an incurably happy giver. You become an incurable giver. I know many of us have already felt this at some point in our life. When you give, when you give a, a gift or you give a smile or you give words of encouragement, how tremendous does that feel to live in that flow and to see what it can do to another person when you, when you share with them authentically? Uh, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. When you discover the wonder of giving, you become an incurable giver. I will do what I do better and better, and I will do more and more of what I do. Think about that for just a moment. What do you do? I'm not still talking about work, it's just we're talking about life. Whatever I do, let me do it better and better and better, and I will do more and more of what I do. So I will keep doing more, better, more better, more better. A committed giver is an incurably happy person, a secure person, a satisfied person, and a prosperous person. I will think give today. Use that as an experiment, folks, in the laboratory of your own life. Think give today. Take a moment and write that statement down, will you? 
I will think give today so that you're reminded of it as you go through the course of your day to think give. And then how are you inspired to give when you think give? A phone call to a friend you haven't talked to in a while just to check in and share some words of encouragement and a moment of communion. A FaceTime or a Zoom call or just reaching out to somebody and saying, you know, I'm just thinking about you. I hope you're doing well. Take such just a little bit of effort. I had the blessing of catching up uh, a couple of days ago with Michael Bogar, who's going to be with us tomorrow at 11 a.m. To, to take a look at the metaphysical uh, Holy Week. And before we even got to the ask, where I asked him to come participate, we spent about 45 minutes getting caught up. We hadn't talked in a while. It blessed my life tremendously. And I know it blessed him because, and I told him at the end of our conversation, so, you know, chatting with you kind of feels like coming home because you know, I've known him for so long. And, He's had such a tremendous influence on my life. So, and I was so blessed by that. We gave to each other in a wonderful, in, in this wonderful time of catching up. So think, give. Today. Butterworth says to the average person. Oh, so that's giving. Now we just went into tithing. Okay. So just to summarize, I get fired up and I start just pressing on and on. So that's the wonder of giving chapter. Okay. Think, give today. Now, the idea of giving is fundamental when we go through these next number of slides that talk about tithing and what tithing is. And we're going we're gonna to explore it. And, and if the idea of tithing makes you kind of ball up, just take a deep breath and know that this is totally life-giving. We're going to go through the history of tithing and uh, folks' resistance to tithing, how people are blessed by tithing. What is tithing anyway? It's such an old idea an old word. Uh, let's get into it. Well, I'm, I'm going this morning. I'm starting to work up a sweat. Forgive me here while I just take care of my, my forehead there. Okay, here we go. So now I love it says a new look at tithing. Butterworth is brilliant how he presents this here. To the average person, tithers are lumped together with vegans and joggers as fanatical followers of cultist practices, which have dubious benefits. I think that's funny. <laughs> Well, who are tithers? These weird people that tithe. Who goes around and talks about tithing? All right, so let's dive into it here. Tithing is normally encouraged for all the wrong reasons. A gross materialization of a beautiful spiritual law. And it's, we're going to bring some light to it here in a moment when I'm actually going to read to you the history of tithing as Butterworth presents it. So we have, so we have some context for it. And I agree. Tithing is, you know, a lot of times people encourage tithing, even a church setting. You got to tithe because it's what you're supposed to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's this forced contract or forced commitment rather than a spontaneous movement of desiring to share where we receive our good. You know, it's the same, it's the same principle of going into a grocery store to buy a gallon, a gallon of milk or a T-bone steak or whatever it is, and you get up to that cash register and you're excited to share your money because you're receiving your good in the form of a gallon of milk or a T-bone steak. You're like, yeah, of course I want to share here. I'm receiving my good. I'm giving my good. It's the most natural form of, of, of circulation to receive and to give. All right. So here's the history of tithing. Bear with me. It's a couple of pages. I'm going to read it right from the book to create some context here. So according to Butterworth, Bible students know the Old Testament often refers to the practice of tithing. The classic reference is Malachi. Even if you're not a Bible student, he unpacks this here, so don't even worry about it, even though it's some old school language. Bring ye the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith Jehovah of hosts, God, the Spirit. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. It is a beautiful statement, sheer poetry. Who could take issue with it? Of course, there is no reason to take issue with it. However, there, neither is there a reason to not ex examine the practice in the time of Malachi. Under Levitical law, the tithe was a form of taxation required of the Hebrews a portion of the produce of the earth and their herds. It wasn't a love offering or charitable contribution at all. In a religious form of government, a theocracy, tithing has often been the method of creating revenues to support the government. 
Since God is the true ruler, it is easily rationalized that the government treasury is the storehouse of the Lord. In early Israel, under the leadership of Moses, the new nation was formed by dividing the body into 12 tribes. One of the tribes, the tribe of Levi, was singled out to serve as the priestly class. Again, in a theocracy, the government is managed by the priests. Thus, the Levites became the bureaucracy, and the system by which they were supported was the tithe. There was nothing voluntary about it. The Mosaic Code was rigidly enforced, and in some cases, infractions were punishable by death. Thank goodness we don't do that. <laughs> this is the biblical source from which our contemporary practice of tithing has derived. However, tithing did not originate there. Some form of tithing was practiced almost universally throughout the ancient world. We find evidence of it in Babylonia, in Persia, in Egypt, in Rome, and even in China. Keep in mind that it was a tithe tax, which probably originated as a tribute laid down by a shrewd conqueror or ruler on his subjects. It may be assumed that the custom of dedicating a tenth of the spoils of war to the gods in time gave rise to a religious extension of the term giving a tenth to God, tithe, giving a tenth to God. It is highly likely that when Abraham gave a tithe of his flocks, he was actually paying a tribute to the ruler for safe passage through his land. So he goes on and on here about this, but, but the, the point is, it was, a, it was a law, it was a structure, and that kind of idea has been handed down over the centuries as something that's the spiritual thing to do. If you're on the spiritual path, it's a have to. It's how you show uh, your commitment to God. And that's not it at all. And we're going to keep exploring that here. So Jesus comes along as he's done. I love this. He's made a career of upgrading laws and observances of the Old Testament. So he would say, that, and, and Moses, and we know about the Ten Commandments and things like that, that law was handed down, it was handed down. So if we, if, if, if we will look biblically at the evolution of consciousness, okay, from a consciousness standpoint, the story, not a, 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 a literal standpoint, but the evolution of consciousness, we see that sometimes laws are appropriate because there's a maturing, there's an immature consciousness that needs structure, like raising my daughter. And again, this isn't mature versus immature and one's good and one's bad there's just the process of maturing over time so if we look at laws handed down a tithe tax or the ten commandments for example these types of things there's an immature consciousness that needs to be held accountable uh raising my daughter we have rules and regulations around our house it creates some form of structure creates some safety it creates a container for an immature consciousness to develop into maturity over the course of time. And we want these uh, laws in our, our house, these rules to be loving and supportive and empowering, but we have to look that it's still created to support and empower and grow an immature consciousness. So tithing as training wheels, Butterworth talks about, that if we look at the, if, if tithing seems like a law, um, it's, a, it's an immature expression of a beautiful spiritual principle, whereas a mature relationship with tithing is governed by spontaneous giving. Do you see the distinction that's being made here? If, it's, if, if we have a relationship with it as law, it's a structure. If we think it's mandated, it's a structure that uh, 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 helps us, that can be used as training wheels. And when we're in right relationship with it, helps us into uh, a relationship with it that then we can see it as spontaneous giving. We can see it as we're, we're, we're tithing or giving because we're moved to, because we're fed by something, because we desire to share, because we're so inspired by sources where we receive our good that we can't help but share our good. Hope that makes sense. There's a lot to cover in there. Um, again, I encourage you to read the book front to back. I don't know if I mentioned this, but at least once a year I read this book because it's so 
such a great reminder. So Jesus took issue with this whole idea. He said, you know, I, I came to illuminate these old laws. And he, he refers to them as the way, biblically, he refers to them as the weightier matters of consciousness. That we're not just talking about uh, law here. We're talking about a full, the letter of the law. We're talking about the spirit of the law. We're talking about a fulfillment of the law. So Jesus comes along and encourages people to consider the weightier matters of consciousness, not tithing as a law, but giving. That's what he, well, that's what he was talking about. The weightier matters of consciousness are the real spirit of the idea of things, to grow in our maturity, to have a real mature relationship now with spiritual law. So a distinction is the ritual of tithing as distinct from the spontaneous process of giving. It could be 10%, could be 5%. Again, literally, tithe means a tenth. But it's the spirit of giving. Where are you giving from? If we're giving from uh, uh, have to, there's a feeling tone and a spirit that goes along with that. That if we're looking at a spectrum that's closer to the to bankruptcy than to prosperity and fulfillment, to spirit closer on the spectrum to spiritual bankruptcy than spiritual prosperity and fulfillment, because there's a have to involved. There's a hesitation. There's a feeling tone of, I have to do this, ma'am, I, I don't really want to, rather than a joy that you give from. And we're going to see an example here of, uh, of a, a, an industry, uh, what's, what, uh, it, his name's William Colgate, and just by the, the name, you figure out what he's done. But he gave more than 10%. We're going to explore that in just a minute. So again, it's about the spontaneous process of giving. So tithing, is a way to establish a giving consciousness, but no substitute for a giving attitude. So again, it's not a have to, folks. We're not talking about something you have to do and you're more spiritual if you give a 10% of your whole tithe. If you give 10% of your paycheck, you're, <coughs> excuse me, you're not more spiritual if you do that. You're not, you're, not, you're, you're not more in the grace of God if you do that. We're more in the grace of God when we're in line with the flow of life and giving and receiving and participating with the flow of circulation. There is no more spiritual. It's just, are we in the divine flow or are we not? And if I'm giving 1%, 5%, 10%, 50%, 50 I want to be in the flow. I want to be giving with joy the same way I receive with joy. The giving attitude, you see. So here it is, William Colgate who founded what will become, I think it's the Colgate Palmolive Company. So pretty successful company. This is back in the eight, late 1800s. When he went to start this business, one of his mentors said, any endeavor that you go into, business endeavor that you go into, the first thing I want you to do is create your account with the Lord. And all money that comes into you, I want you to set aside 10% of it to share in charitable, uh, for charitable endeavors, charitable causes, to create your account with the Lord. That is, you're receiving so much good that set aside some so that you can give that good as well. So he did that when he started his company, his account with the Lord, 10% of all money that came in was put aside in the account with the Lord. And he found causes and ways that he wanted to uh, share that financial good. Uh, in various places, because it brought him so much joy. He knew about the law of giving and receiving and sharing and circulating. So we started with 10%. And his business was so wildly successful that eventually he upped that from 10% to 20%. And business and people thought he was crazy. Like, what are you doing? And then again, this is back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. You're giving away 20% of all the money that comes into you. And he's like, of course, look how wildly successful my business is. Why wouldn't I do this? It feels so good to give. He eventually ended up sharing 50% of all of his, the money that came into his company in places where he received his good in places that he wanted to support and empower. 50% of all the money that came in, he shared. And you can see his business still successful today. He's long gone, but from a legacy standpoint, his blessing continues to be shared. 50% of what came into his company is shared. Now, does that frighten you? Does that give you pause? Does that make you go, ooh, 50%? Are you kidding me? 
his business continued to grow. Again, it's not about the 50%. It's not about the 5%. It's not about, it could be 90%. It could be 1%. It's about being in right relationship with the law of circulation. And that has everything to do with consciousness, with your attitudes and beliefs about life, how you touch things, how you touch everything. This is giving. Account with the Lord. Consider that idea. Do you want to create an account with the Lord? So back in the, uh, uh, that, that reference that we made to in the history of tithing, we talked about, uh, it, was, it was referred to as the whole tithe. So Kale Gibran says, you give little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. The whole tithe has nothing to do with just money. It's everything. It's the whole tithe. How blessed and good is your life right now? How blessed are you? Don't you feel like giving for how blessed you are? Giving in every single way? Tithe, not because you have to, but because you desire to be an incurably happy giver. Isn't that a beautiful statement? You can write that down and, and, and put it up in various and conspicuous places in your, in your car, in your home. I desire to be an incurably happy giver. What if you're incurably happy? Doesn't that sound cool? I mean, I just, just saying those words brings a spontaneous smile to my face. I desire to be incurably happy. And an ingredient in being incurably happy is to give. Be an incurably happy giver. And remember, always, because we do seek to receive the good life as well, here, receive this blessing. And what are my hands doing? They're in the exact same position to receive my own blessing. All right. Now, the summary of the book. I love this chapter. It's so appropriate for right now. Even if you weren't to read the entire book, read this final chapter. It's just, it's, it's so magnificent. It's called The New World Order, as you can see on your, on your screen there. So let's get into it. Economic conditions, no matter how dire they appear to be, are in the world out there. What counts is how you deal with them in consciousness. Paul said, don't let the world around you squeeze you to its own, in, into its own mold, but let God remold your mind from within. One more time. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your mind from within. Again, how do we do this? Goes back to what uh, Emerson referred to. I think it was Emerson in one of those earlier slides. It's so important for us to have an intimate, personal relationship with the spirit so that we can be made new over and over again, especially right now. In the, in, 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 in the, in the, on the Christian calendar and Christian mythology and the Christian story, that's all that's happening right now. New life, be made new, springtime, flowers are sprouting, et cetera, et cetera. When we commune with the spirit within, we are made new and we can't be affected by, you know, the, all the commentary out there about the crashing of the economy and what's happening and the, and the, and the hardship that people are experiencing. Believe me, I, I, again, I have compassion and I know that there's a lot of challenge happening in the world right now. And what counts is how you deal with this in consciousness, tending to the garden of your own mind, tending to the garden of your own heart, because that's where things are created from. Again, things are always created twice, first in consciousness or in thought, and then in form. And then only form is secondary. Don't let the world around you squeeze to its panic and its anxiety and its fear right now, but let God remold your mind from within. Classes like this, your meditation, your affirmative prayer, your empowering dialogue with, with, with your team. There may be times when you do not have sufficient money, but you can never be separated from the all-sufficiency of God's substance within. When you begin to assume mastery over your thoughts, you become attuned to the evolution that leads to the unfoldment of the kind of things and experiences you desire. 
when you begin to assume mastery over your thoughts, your consciousness, you become attuned to the evolution that leads to the unfoldment of the kind of things and experiences you desire. Again, tend to your garden. Does it seem like we're talking in circles? Sometimes, but there's only one thing that we're talking about through all of these class installments here, and that is your relationship with your life. Do you desire to be free and fulfilled or suffer and live in fear? I already know the answer. Freedom and fulfillment. In the Chinese language, the symbols used the characters in the word crisis are two words, danger and opportunity. So what opportunity is in front of you during these times right now, during these times of challenge? It does look dangerous. It looks like the enemy's at the gates, but what opportunity is there right now as well? What opportunity can you have? Do you want, do you desire to be, uh, uh, re, to, to let God remold you, remake you from within? How do you want to be remade during this time? How do you want to be made anew during this time of, of uh, quarantining and, 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 and being in our own space, to use it wisely, to not use it to suffer and to uh, uh, court anxiety and fear and doubt, but to be made new, the opportunity to become an incurably happy giver and do the things necessary in your life for that to happen. Deschardins. Uh, it's a wonderful idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this again directly from the book. Um, it's, it's exactly what's happening right now. There is now incontrovertible evidence that mankind, that humanity, has just entered upon the greatest period of change the world has ever known. The ills from which we are suffering have had their seat in the very foundation of human thought. But today, something is happening to the whole structure of human consciousness. A fresh kind of life is starting. In the face of such an upheaval, actually shaken by it, no one can remain indifferent. Swept along by the tide of affairs, what can we do to see clearly and act decisively? No matter what reactions we may have to current events, we ought first to reaffirm a robust faith in the destiny of humanity. And that is freedom. That's always knocking on the door of our consciousness, financial freedom, freedom of health, freedom in relationships, a robust faith in our destiny. That is, we come from God, the living spirit, and to God, we are destined to return in consciousness, you see. It's wake-up time, folks. Let's do it. Let's, let's be about it intentionally. As folks may view the world in crisis, empowered thinkers must remember the vision of wholeness, poised with the wisdom and creativity required to take the next logical step in the progress of civilization. Remember to hold a vision of wholeness, of your wholeness, poised with the wisdom and creativity required to take the next logical steps in the progress of civilization. Many, many people have theories and ideas of what's happening right now and what will come out of it. And we can make all sorts of assumptions. We're going to see what's going to come out of it. It's going to be something beautiful. We have an opportunity right now to recreate our idea of being one human family, to recreate the, to, to, to regenerate and be made new, the idea of who we are with each other, how we could hold each other up. And that starts with holding ourselves up right now and inspiring uh, and being inspired and sharing. This revolution is being televised and a revolution is happening. Be an empowered part of the revolution, an empowered part of what's happening right now and what we're growing into. Psychologists estimate that not one person in a million is living up to the best that is in him or her. Isn't that amazing? I mean, we talk about 
you know, the studies about how much of our brain we're using and, and things like this. We want to indulge our creativity. How much of your creativity of your indul are you indulging? How much of your spiritual power are you indulging? How much of your, uh, are, you, are you doing things to expand right now? Are you curious about new ways of being? I mean, many of us have had to be curious about new ways of technology, technology that's been there, but now utilizing that. What are new ways that you can use your creativity right now so that you can start living up to your potential, living up to what's possible for your life, to feel connected to it, to feel inspired by it, to feel in love with it, so that you can be part of the data sample that says, I'm really living up to my potential. I believe that I'm living my greatness. I'm sharing my good. And that's a daily inventory to take because sometimes we don't feel so inspired to roll out of bed and jump up and down and say, yippee ki -yay, here we go. You want to constantly be mindful. Where are you again in relationship with your own life? Indulge your good and your creativity. So speaking of being empowered, so many years ago in uh, the state of New Jersey, there was an, uh, uh, an, well, an experiment that was connected, conducted in, and supported by uh, the New Jersey State Office of Unemployment and a few other entities that was called the Patterson Plan. This experiment was to take 500 individuals that were chronically unemployed or underemployed, chronically. And again, that refers to a state of consciousness. I remember earlier in some of the earlier sessions and classes, we talked about if you are unemployed or facing economic challenge, sometimes we can just get frozen in that and become stagnant because of the bitterness and being victimized, et cetera, et cetera. So these folks said, okay, let's take 500 people and give them a two week crash course in all sorts of empowerment. Uh, empowerment as far as uh, how, to, how to conduct a job interview, how to fill out an application, how to put a resume together. Uh, empowerment is from a spiritual standpoint, from a thinking standpoint, from a uh, uh, just empowerment. Two week crash course all day long for two weeks in being empowered. And then set them out to find work without no strings being pulled, no, uh, you know, special deals being made. All right, you're empowered now. You can do an interview. You put your resume together, et cetera, et cetera. Now go out and see what you're made of. Within a year, 400 or 80% of those 500 people were permanently employed within one year. What does that tell us? Empowerment to uh, uh, um, be in right relationship with life again, to see ourselves as worthy, to see that we have a contribution to make. This is part of the new world order. This is part of what's happening right now for all of us, that we can be more empowered, more encouraged to live our best life, share ourselves freely. Within a year, 400 of those 500 were permanently employed that had been chronically under or unemployed. And what they, were, what they meant by that, I think it was three years, that they hadn't worked in at least three years. Now, all of a sudden, they were an empowered part of the workforce. Isn't that wonderful? What happened to it? It just went away. It didn't get picked up. That's so interesting. But that's what we want to do is empower people to think powerfully and positively and see themselves in, in, in the flow, in the divine flow of goodness. Poverty as a collective condition can only be corrected by helping people one by one to stir up the gift of life within them. That's all we've been wanting to do through this class is stir up the gift of life within us. Whether you're employed, not employed, retired, whatever it is, this is, this is all that we're talking about. Stirring up the gift of life within, being empowered. Then when two or three people agree to a consciousness of prosperity and creativity, a modest influence begins to take hold. So I get empowered, Jeff gets empowered, you get empowered, we then, the three of us, get together and say, holy smokes, we're empowered. We agree, as we talked about in a previous class, we agree that we are empowered. An influence takes shape there. It has an influence. Not only do we feel good, but we start to uh, affect and infect our community around us with empowerment. 
It's contagious. This is the real contagion that we want to catch. Prosperity. It's going around. Catch it. And then get on the phone or get with your partner and, and say, we are empowered today. Let's get, get creative. Let's welcome new ideas and new thoughts. And influence takes hold. Ah, yes, Charles Fillmore, the founder of Unity. If you didn't know, Eric Butterworth is a Unity minister, so of course he was influenced by Charles Fillmore, who's the founder of Unity, says it like this. Again, just take these words in. Listen to the words of Charles Fillmore as he sends out a clarion call to the new world order. In the new era, now at its dawn, we shall have a spirit of prosperity. The principle of the universal substance will be known and acted upon, and there will be no place for lack. Supply will be more equalized. There will not be millions of bushels of wheat stored in musty warehouses while people go hungry. There will be no overproduction or underconsumption or other inequities of supply, for God's substance will be recognized and used by all people. People will not pile up fortunes one day and lose them the next, for they will not fear the integrity of their neighbors. Again, where are those Clorox wipes? In, is this an impractical utopia? The answer depends on you. Just as soon as you individually do your part in quickening the consciousness of the whole economy, in quickening the consciousness of your economy, your system, your life. And to sum it all up, beautiful people, the final slide of our lessons. I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. God bless you all. It's been a wonderful journey sharing these three uh, days with you. I, I pray that in some way, this material has been of benefit to you and that you are ready to be empowered uh, in, in your spiritual economy, in your system, that you're ready to be empowered in your life to be creative and fulfilled and blessed in every way. Just a couple of uh, uh, quick announcements before we sign off. Tomorrow, at 11 a.m., 11 a.m. Pacific time, so if you're on the East Coast too, et cetera, et cetera, Michael Bogar will be facilitating metaphysical uh, interpretation of, the, of Holy Week, of the Christian, uh, of, of the idea of Holy Week, Easter season that we're in right now. Michael is a, 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 a tremendous man. He's one of the brightest minds I know, and he's very studied, and he's a critical thinker, and he's a tremendous inspiration. So I very much encourage you to be there tomorrow at 11 a.m. And then let's see, we've got, a, of course, our Easter service on Sunday that will be available starting at 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday. Um, and then next week, we have some more wonderful events happening for you at 10 a.m. all week long. Uh, I think the Dr. Joe is going to start uh, with the, uh, on Monday, uh, chapter one of the Science of Mind, illuminating uh, chapter one of Science of Mind and go through the first few chapters of that book uh, and Ernest Holmes. It's going to be wonderful. That starts Monday. I would encourage you to uh, find the uh, PayPal button or the, the, the uh, get giving button uh, if you're uh, so moved to share your financial good to continue to support our center uh, as we move through these times and continue to offer you uh, all of these wonderful things that we're offering you. Please support us financially and uh, God bless you. We appreciate you. Have a magnificent day. See you tomorrow at 11 a.m. for Michael Bogar. God bless you. Peace. Peace. Barbara says thank you. Stephanie says thank you. Awesome and timely class. Andrea, so grateful. Thank you so much from Val. Well, thank you all for uh, thanking me, <laughs> and uh, it's truly my joy to present this material to you, and uh, 
uh, as, it, as inspiring as it's been for me to, to walk with Eric Butterworth for all these years and year after year. Uh, it's my joy to share it with you. Again, I really do encourage you to get the book, Spiritual Economics, pick it up, study it, read it through, pick at it. That's kind of what I do. I don't just go page to page, which interestingly enough is what Ernest Holmes used to do when he would come across a new um, bit of, uh, of uh, a, a new book or something that inspired him. He would actually read a page or a paragraph and then put the book down and meditate on it for a while. He would just be with the material and metabolize it until he got some sort of insight out of it. And then he would move on to the next page or the next paragraph. So it's another exercise you could participate with as well. So Eric Butterworth, Spiritual Economics. Thank you for thanking me. Uh, Jeff just told me a, a number of people uh, were expressing gratitude. I receive it. And I also express gratitude back to you. Um, I love you and I'm willing to accept your love. Peace out. This time for real. <laughs>